Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, I bring you all greetings from the Diocese of Jerusalem, and especially to Bishop Allen and Dean Amy here at St. Paul's Cathedral in the Diocese of Massachusetts. Thank you so very much for your invitation to preach in this beautiful space of worship this morning and to join you in your celebration of Holy Eucharist. Canon Don and I are also grateful for the wonderful hospitality you have shown us during our visit this week at a time when we have rejoiced to attend our first in-person board meeting for the American Friends of the Diocese of Jerusalem in two years. And I'm grateful to Bishop Greg, as well as my dear brother John Lent, and all the board members for this wonderful opportunity to be together here in Boston. We hope now that the pandemic will finally be coming to an end so that we can welcome some of you to Jerusalem in the very near future. This morning, our scriptures bring us a wealth of images and stories that are all centered around the theme of servanthood, a very important theme for our daily life and our daily walk with Christ. In our first reading, we have Isaiah's prophecy of a servant who suffered on behalf of his people. The prophet tells us that he was led to the, his death like a lamb to a slaughter. Yet he did not open his mouth. What's more, he did not do this for himself. But for our sake, he was wounded for our transgressions. The prophet tells us that he has led to his death like a lamb to the slaughter. And above all, by his wounds, we are all healed. For Christians, Isaiah's words were fulfilled on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ. He willingly gave up his life as an act of servanthood so that we might have life and have it abundantly. For Christians, Isaiah's words fulfilled that wonderful promise of old in the person of Jesus Christ. The epistle to the Hebrews picks up on that theme, that very same theme of servanthood. There, Jesus is seen as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He was the mysterious high priest, once came out of Jerusalem to bless Abraham in the book of Genesis. Yet even though Jesus was the central high priest and the eternal high priest, he did not take advantage of this position. Instead, he learned obedience to God by offering up himself as an everlasting sacrifice. In this way, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Isaiah's prophecy and Hebrews' spiritual reflection clearly show that Jesus embodied the way of servanthood as the central feature of his ministry. And so we do not see Jesus being concerned with his own position or authority or power. Instead, we see him focused on the spiritual and physical needs of the people around him. Even before Good Friday, first Good Friday, Jesus spent three years of his public ministry teaching spiritual truths and laying his hands upon those who were sick and needy. He would spend such long days doing this that he would fall asleep in the boat afterwards, even not waking up when a storm threatened to sink the boat. 
Yet despite this constant example of servant leadership, Jesus' disciples did not always get the message. They did not always understand what it means to be a leader. They were still more concerned about position, authority, and power that about and not so much about serving others. James and John show this most clearly in today's Gospel reading. As we heard, they went up to Jesus and asked to be seated at his right hand and his left in the positions of honor in the future kingdom. Jesus immediately saw that they were not getting the message. They were not understanding. So he called all the disciples, he called the ten, together with James and John, and told them that they are to be concerned with people, people's lives and ministry, and not their own way of life. They are to be concerned not about the way the world is managed and performed, but about the way of God. God's way was the way of servanthood, and that is the lesson Jesus wanted to teach them. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, he said to them, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. Now the interesting thing is that the other member of the twelves were angry about James and John for asking those seats of honor. But by becoming angry, we know that they were all thinking the same thing. They wanted those seats for themselves instead of them being given to the two brothers. But Jesus pointed to his own example, his own life's example. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, he said, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is something that all Christians must understand, especially leaders in the church. We know last week, as you know, maybe last week, I, me and Don were in Egypt uh, for the inauguration of the new province of Alexandria, which uh, previously was part of the province of Jerusalem and the Middle East. The morning of the service, I had the privilege to meet with Archbishop Justin Wilby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he had just been with Pope Francis um, a couple of days before we met. And during their meeting, the Pope shared with Archbishop Justin um, a wonderful image about leadership and ministry, which I would like to share with you in, in, in turn. The image had to do with sheep and shepherds. You know Pope Francis grew in Argentina where there are a lot of sheep and so he had the chance to often watch the behavior of the shepherds with their flocks. Pope Francis said that the good shepherd positions himself or herself at three different places with the sheep. In front, in the middle, and at the back, in the rear. He stands at the front so that he can view what is ahead and choose the best way to, to reach an abundant and green pastures. But the Good Shepherd does not always stay at the head of the flock. That's because the sheep need the reassurance and personal presence. They need the, the personal relationship, so to speak. So the Good Shepherd must go into the midst of the sheep and be with them and to speak to them so that they know his voice and the shepherd hears theirs. But even then, the Good Shepherd must not remain in the, just these two places. He must also go to the rear of the flock, to the place where there are some stragglers. Sheep are moving along too slowly to catch up. He does not want them to be left behind and separated from the flock, so the shepherd must sometimes prod a few of them along 
while still encouraging them. By being in these all three positions in the flock, the Good Shepherd shows, shows he is a servant or she is a servant of the sheep and concerned for their welfare. In other words, being a shepherd, it's not being about oneself. This image from, the, from Pope Francis uh, that the Archbishop of Canterbury shared with me is a powerful metaphor for servant leadership. It also reflects the way that Jesus himself lived among the people. Sometimes he was out front, uh, leading. Often he was in the midst of people tending uh, to their needs. And sometimes he went to the rear to deal with the stragglers. This is an example of servant leadership that we all must seek to follow both individually and corporately. In the Holy Land, the Christian presence is very small. It is now less than 2%, down from more than 25% 100 years ago. But even though the number of Christians is small, because we are committed to this servant leadership, we have a great impact in serving the people there who need help the most. We are the first, first and foremost, I would say that we are bridge builders between the three Abrahamic faiths, helping to bring people of different religions together rather than separating them. At my installation this past May, even though we had a war and riots around us, around the cathedral, literally, we had our cathedral, in our cathedral, Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the service during the installation. It was a wonderful testimony to God's amazing grace and love for all. And then for our, as Anglicans, we are also bridged between many of the other denominations. We are able to do this because we have not been around in Jerusalem at least for that long, as long as the Greeks or the Latins or the Armenians or the Ethiopians are in, and even other denominations in Jerusalem. And so we have no ancient holy places as they do. For this reason, the other leaders trust us because they know we are fair and impartial. And here I want to say that I learned a new word from Bishop Alan this week. When I used the word impartial, he said, maybe I, I think there's another word that explains that. You know, first being fair and being impartial, it means being all partial. And I think being all partial with love is exactly what we are called to be as servant leaders. But most of all, we are, we are a servant of anyone who comes to us in need. And that is the attitude of the Diocese of Jerusalem. The Diocese has over 30 different charitable institutions, hospitals, schools, clinics, rehabilitation centers, and retirement homes, and guest houses. And because there are so few Christians, we actually serve mostly the Muslim population, as well as Christians and Jews who come to us. Many of those families who are poor, especially now with the pandemic, that they can't pay for services we provide. And so we spend a lot of our time raising money for the medical supplies and the staff salaries that are needed in order to help others along the way. We also provide scholarships for so many of the students that enable them to secure a future for themselves and their future families. And beyond our institutions, the clergy in our 27 parishes provide support for families who cannot pay even for food for themselves during these difficult times. And especially, especially in Lebanon at this time, where there is great difficulty. And I really would like to thank the American friends for helping us to secure such needs for the people who are in dire 
needs at the moment. This is not something that we could ever do by ourselves. And that is the reason we are here, because we are grateful that we have such wonderful partners and friends in ministry here in America. And to that we are ever grateful. This also fits the meaning of servant leadership, because servant leadership is shared leadership. It is not dependent on one person, but on the entire body of Christ. You know, today's sciences may call this teamwork, may call this shared or whatever, but all along we have this wonderful image of working together, knitted in the, through love within the body of Christ, where one member aches, the whole body aches with it. And so this morning, my, my dear friends, my message to you is one of gratitude for the way that many of you have been living into this servant leadership that is the focus of our scripture this morning. We are grateful to share with you in this lesson of, uh, of what it means to be partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. We are witnesses together of Christ's message of love and reconciliation in the Holy Land, a place that needs many prayers and much support. Please accept our thanks and gratitude for your continued prayers and support in this partnership as we continue to face many challenges in the region, challenges that come from the pandemic, from the economic situation in Lebanon, from the long civil war in Syria, and from the ongoing struggle for a just and lasting peace in Israel and Palestine and in the Holy Land. I hope many of you could indeed soon visit us in Jerusalem, where we will be glad to welcome you as sisters and brothers in Christ and introduce you to the living stones, your fellow citizens of the kingdom. In the meantime, please know that you remain in our prayers of thanksgiving for your continual love and support for our mission of servanthood in the land where our Lord once lived, ministered, and indeed laid down his life so that we would have more abundant life in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Amen.